Welcome, it's another Sunday night, and it's another episode of Scorecard here on City TV. My name is Daniel Cranting. This is a show that puts into perspective all the major sports and highlights of the weekend, and it has been some weekend of sports. And we'll start off with the women's AFCON. Um, it's ongoing, it's match day three, that's the final match of the group stages. Teams are pushing um, for places in the quarterfinals, we'll tell you all about that. There's also some, uh, some transfer news, Ghanaian players are involved. Um, Chelsea, Manchester United trying to wrap up deals. They struggle to sign players um, throughout this window, but it looks like um, both teams are nearing all that. Chelsea is nearing a couple of signings. And then we also have some preseason action. We know it's preseason time, Arsenal were in action. Gabriel Jesus... He scored on his debut or his um, non-competitive debut for Arsenal. He was on targets there in a preseason friendly in Germany. Um, Jordan Ayew was also on target. We'll show you all those highlights. And then today was the men's final, the Wimbledon men's final. Novak Djokovic, he goes past Roger Federer in terms of all-time Grand Slams. He now has 21 Grand Slams. Nadal still leads with 22. And Federer is left behind with 20. We'll give you all that and more. This is Scorecard on City TV. Don't go away. Welcome back. This is Scorecard on City TV. My name is Daniel Cranting. You can also join in the conversation um, on the WhatsApp line. It will come just on your screen in a bit. Yes, uh, plus 233-550-58832. That's the WhatsApp line. Or on Twitter, just use the hashtag Scorecard and read all your messages. But let me introduce my guests today. A different pack. I brought them in from um, <laughs> the City Sports Roundup show. It's um, Emmanuel Nubo and Sydney Antonio. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Doing good, doing good. Fantastic. Yeah, it's, um, it's been an interesting weekend of sports. It has. Very interesting, mm -hmm. very interesting. My highlight was today. <laughs> yeah, of Novak Djokovic. <laughs> Novak Djokovic <laughs> getting that 21. It's been a very long time. Look, I waited since um, last year, the US Open final. Medvedev beat him, but finally, finally, he gets to um, 20. But we'll start off with um, the women's Afghan is ongoing in Morocco. There, um, a couple of games were played yesterday. There are still some couple of games going on. But yes, it's match day three. It's a final match day of the group stage, and teams are pushing for um, quarterfinal places. We'll start with that game between Burkina Faso and Uganda. It ended 2-2 uh, two -two draw. Um, Burkina Faso had a red card in that game, in fact, but they still managed to hold on for a 2-2 two -two draw. Um, Morocco were also in action, and they beat Senegal by one goal to nil, so they booked a place in the quarterfinals. And then uh, Zambia, they were also 4-1 winners over Togo. So we'll take that game between Burkina Faso and Uganda. So comfortable victory there for the Zambians. They are also through to the quarterfinals. But let's show you the group um, table so that we can get some perspective to that. So that's group A. Uh, Morocco qualified, um, Senegal qualified. Burkina Faso will not make it. Um, so the format is that it's three groups. It's the first two in each group. And then the best two third place finishers. So Burkina Faso by virtue of one point. Um, they've been kicked out because the other two third place um, teams have, uh, of course, more points than them. Let's look at Group B. Let's have Group B now. Yes, so Zambia also through. Um, Cameroon are through by second place. And then uh, Tunisia also went through with three points. So, yes, those are the three teams um, through from Group B. Um, guys, um, some interesting matches, but more interesting is the goalkeeping. <laughs> Yeah, some interesting goalkeeping we are seeing there in the tournament. I, I, I think to begin with, I would, I would say that I'm, I'm happy with the quality of the pitches mm -hmm. and then the quality of the stadium. But I can't see the same with the quality of the football. There are some schoolboy mm -hmm. defending goalkeeping. School school <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, I, I think the quality of play is quite low. And yeah. it, it scares me a bit because if this is what we are going to take to the World Cup, you know, be surprised to see score lines like 10 and 12 and 15 nil if you come up against a team like the USA, Japan, or Germany. So I think that there's a lot when it comes to development of the African female game, and I think we need to take it more serious because if this is this is this is the Afcon, the women's Afcon, and what is being presented is. It's, it's like you're watching an SS team or something playing. I think we need to do better. Um, Antonio, interesting. Um, Imano made a point about um, quality. He makes a point about quality. He talks about going to the World Cup. Um, the European Championships are also going on. That's the um, Women's Euros. It's also going on. If you look at the level of football they are playing, um, it sort of buttresses his point that when we take our, our players there or our teams there, we could be struggling. That brings us back to the format um, of qualification. This uh, zonal qualifi uh, qualification that most um, countries have been um, complaining about. That's the reason Ghana is not there because Ghana had to face um, Nigeria in the 
first round of qualifiers. So you have um, the best out of each zone and not necessarily the best in the continent going to the AFCON. And this will certainly affect um, the teams that are going to the World Cup. Yes, you have put it perfectly, perfectly over there. And we need to take we need to take a second look at the way the African, the, the women's game in Africa is going because, as she has rightly said, the uh, Euro women's game is ongoing right now and I was able to catch a few highlights and you can see that the difference in quality is just glaring. It's worlds apart. You look at teams like Norway, Sweden, mm -hmm. who I won't say they are traditional superpowers as compared to the likes of USA and maybe the uh, likes of Germany. But they are coming up, they are, they are doing something where you can see that these teams, uh, these countries have taken a look at their structure, they have taken a look at what can help them best. And they are doing, bringing in some new ideas, bringing in some new strategy to boost their game a bit. And you come back home, and as I have said, it starts from the top. It starts from the organization on the African level. Mm -hmm. Already that one leaves a lot to be desired. It has to be looked at before you come to the individual countries mm -hmm. and what we are doing individually to boost the game, the women game in the African, on the African continent. It's very bad. Look at some of the highlights we just saw right now. Atrocious defending, atrocious goalkeeping, even <laughs> worse striking. Sometimes the ball is in the net before the keeper is diving. I mean, how, can, how can you expect to make waves? That's what we are looking for. It when we yeah. see African teams in a global competition, we all root for them because they are, you know, we are all African brothers and sisters. So we want African brothers and sisters in this case to do well. But it's hard to support when you, you, are, you are getting these kind of returns, and that goes back to when. Uh, we have all sorts of trumpeteers calling for this equal pay when it comes to football, men's football. How can you give equal pay when the difference in quality is so glaring? So we have to look at these things. And I believe if I'm able to look at because we have the quality here, we have the talent here. There are talented female players in the country who, given the right resources, given the right help, they can, they, I think they can do far better than some of their European counterparts. But it starts from the beginning, it starts from the grassroots, and it starts from... Uh, the, G the, the football organizations taking a second look at the structure and bringing something better than what, what's, what's on offer right now. I'm glad you said it, but just to put some things in pers perspective, it's not, like, it's not like every match is bad. When you watch the Nigerians, you watch the South Africans, you watch um, even the Moroccans to some extent, the Cameroonians, you can tell the class between them and the rest of the teams is, is, is so vast and it just shows you how good they are and how the, the gap between the good teams in Africa and the rest are. So, um, we are just saying, look, this, this format thing is, is, is just some way. If they can change it, they should change it. So we have the best of the best competing. So every match is worth watching. But um, aside that, let's uh, move away from the women's football. Let's go to some transfer news now. It's um, transfer season. Um, the summer transfer window is open. Clubs are um, trying to get players in, trying to boost the strength of their team. Um, I'll start on a local front. Now, um, Mohamed Kudus. Um, two seasons ago, he made that move from Nordjylland to Ajax. It was supposed to be um, that move that propelled him to greater things. It ha hasn't necessarily worked for him at Ajax due to a number of different things, um, mainly injury. But um, on Friday, news surfaced in France that um, Nice have inquired about his services from Ajax. Um, £12 million, pounds, it looks like that's his uh, value. Um, quite surprising. Um, Ajax got him for £8 million pounds two years ago and then he's... 12 million pounds, kind of, it's, it's cheap considering the sort of talent and the ability that he brings into the, into the page. But let me, let me come to you, Sydney. Look, um, what do you make of this? this if, if Nice persists, should he go? I think he should go. I think he should go because, well, we all supported him. We were, we were just found fair in the country because we have one of the young, bright prospects going to one of uh, Europeans' traditionally biggest clubs, Ajax. Nobody can question their quality. Nobody can question their standing in the European game. And when he left to Ajax, we were all happy for him. We were all excited to see him play, excited to see him in the Champions League, mm. excited to see him in the latter stages of the Champions League, excited to see him look, showing what he can do at the highest stage, but he hasn't gone to plan at all. At the beginning, we can say that, yes, he, he was making waves, so he got a horrific injury against... In the, in the match against Liverpool in the Champions League. And yeah. that has just derailed his career at Ajax so far. So if I were to be a, an advisor of Mohamed Kudus, I would tell him to take the chance because going to Nice is not a bad, it's not a bad place to go because Nice, nice uh, I won't say they are one of the biggest... But isn't the French League a bit too physical? It is, it is too physical. <laughs> it is too, but look at the progression of the players that play in the French League. 
the French league we can say it's a feeder league for a big, some of the bigger leagues. Uh, for most, the biggest example is the English Premier League. If you do well in France, you are fast track to go to England. So it's been a more physical league. It has its good side and its bad side. The good side is that if you're able to make it there, you are on the fast track, you're on the highway to getting the big bucks and the brighter lights, the EPL. And if you can't survive there, then it brings to the question your quality and it brings to the question because it's sometimes you have to take a step back before you can move forward. Happy, I've seen it happen a lot of times, a lot of uh, instances where players sometimes it seems as if they're taking a step back in their career. But look at Renato Sanchez. He, uh, he was doing so well. He went to Bayern Munich. He, he fought it off. He has come back. He came back to Leo. He has done well at Leo. And he's looking as if he's going to get a bigger move very soon. So mm -hmm. I won't say it's a bad move for Kudus. I think he, he has the tools to succeed in France. He has the, the right temperament to also succeed in France. And I would advise him to go for, for that move. Imano, for somebody who was... Um, he, or he is still touted as the next big thing, uh, big thing over here. But that move to Ajax was supposed to be the, 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 the big move. He was supposed to um, set the ground running. And it's, in, in his early weeks, it looked like things were going to get better for him, of course. Things were going to, um, he was going to hit the, the, the road and, and, and yeah. progress into a, a much, much better player than he came. But then the injury struck. But then there's another school of thought that talks about Ten Hag leaving. Players also leaving. This could be his chance because if you look in midfield, he's played in deep um, DM before. He's played central midfield, he's played attacking midfield. Grabbing back who looked like took his place has left. So there's a vacancy there. A number of players have left. A new coach is coming in. Maybe staying and trying to work his way back into the new coach's plans will be the best. Or? I think I, side, I, I, I seem to side with that story as I indicated on Friday. Because I do believe that with the overhaul that's going on at Ajax, there's a new coach coming in. Mm. He's more likely to become, let's say, a senior figure there, seeing that he's been through the ranks and he knows how the team runs. And then with the Dutch teams, we know that the system per se is not going to change. Yeah. And the technical education when it comes to playing football is not going to change. So seeing that, especially seeing that this is a World Cup year, you do want to make a move that you now have to learn the culture. Mm. I mean, it's, it's Netherlands to France. There's a cultural difference. I think that's very difference. important, this being a World Cup. Exactly. Game. And you, you would you'd want to get to the World Cup in tip-top form. And the best way to do that is to play a league in which you are familiar with. So I would say, and Ajax also kept faith with him. Throughout the injuries and everything, they still had him in their plans and everything. So I would say, give it a, give it a year. It looks like now he's fit and he's well to play. Mm. Play throughout the season. You know Ajax will be competing in the Champions League. You'd want your players to be playing against the big boys. It says they are metal. It puts them in the right shape, shape physically. It puts them in the right um, frame of mind mentally also going into the World Cup. So our advocates, give it a year. If, if it goes well, there'll still be interest there. And even at that time, your price value would actually have gone high if you are able to perform well. So I'll see. there's an overhaul going on at Ajax. It looks like he'll be a mainstay. He'll be a senior figure there. Give it a year get some games under your legs, perfect your craft, play against the big boys, test yourself, then you'll be ready for the World Cup. And then even after that, mm -hmm. it could even propel you to a bigger move because the World Cup is the biggest advert for any player. Yeah. So once you get in there, you perform, you're, you're good to go. Guys, let's, let's shift the conversation now. Let's now go to Chelsea. Um, they've been struggling um, to get signings. It looks like Todd Bowley is, anytime he reads the papers and he finds that somebody's um, on, the, on the transfer market or for sale, then he jumps in there. But it looks like he's going to finally get his first signing of the window. And we know that Manchester City and Chelsea have agreed a deal um, for Raheem Sterling. And uh, Chelsea are still in the um, running for um, uh, Nathan Ake. Let's start with Sterling. What will he bring to this Chelsea team in terms of his, his ability? What, is he the sort of player that Chelsea needs, Antonio? I think, I think so. I think so because... Look at Stel, look at the careers he has had so far. Since he broke through, well, his QPR days were not really much to write about. But he first came into our memories and into the limelight at Liverpool in that fantastic team headed by Luis Suarez that almost, uh, that were almost crowned Premier League champions with, if not for an unlucky fellow who... <laughs> um, almost doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> but for one man who jinxed the whole club. <laughs> you, know, you know, I've won with, with Sterling. But he, since then, he, he went to Man City. Initially, it wasn't going all too well. And then Gadula came in the picture. And when Gadula came in the picture, I remember when uh, he came, there were news reports that Gadula called Sterling personally 
assuring him that he was he was coming to play a style of football that was going to benefit him so he should get himself prepared for the new season and, and all that mm. and since then we have just seen the meteoric cries i would say of Sterling. we have seen him performing at consistent levels look at his goals every season look at his assets every season look at his general performance to the uh, to the to to man city's uh, rise you, you can't you can't tell the tale of man city from 2016 or 2017 to now without mentioning Raheem Sterling. He's a player who now has, he's now, he has, he joined, recently joined the 100 goal Premier League club. Yeah. He got, he, he scores assists, he scores benders, I mean, he scores uh, hat tricks, he scores benders. He, he's, a, he's, a, he's a very creative player. So I don't think it's a bad signing. I think it's a good signing, really good signing for, for Chelsea. Looking at his, his influence when it comes to the English national team also. Mm. Look at the way. Uh, he comes to the fore when they need him the most. Look at the last Euros. I think Sterling was uh, probably the best player. So Sidney, you know. I, I, I want to push you there. But look, <laughs> I always say this thing. You see, Chelsea, the top, the top six, they see themselves as rivals. They see themselves as battling for the same trophies. If Manchester City have reached the stage where they deem Sterling surplus to requirements, they've got better players. Last season, he hardly had playing time. It looks like he's on the decline. Should Chelsea be swooping in for him? Why not? Because if let's let's compare the levels of Man City and Chelsea right now. Man City are operating as right now on a on a different level from Chelsea. Man City can be compared to maybe two a league of maybe two or three teams in the whole of Europe right now. So Man City releasing a player doesn't necessarily mean the player isn't a good player. It's not up to scratch mm. because look at some of the other players that. They are in the news as uh, being ready to listen to offers for. They, not to, not so long ago, they were listening to offers for Bernardo Silva, and there are still rumors that Bernardo Silva might find himself at Barcelona. And you can't question the, the obvious talents and the obvious quality of a player like Bernardo Silva. Yeah. They are also letting someone like Nathan Ake go. Ake maybe he's not one of their first team players, but he's been an important squad player, and not only for Man City but only also for Netherlands. He also forms. A, a, a core part of that uh, Netherlands team which has performed so well since Louis van Gaal took over which, who are going to this World Cup as one of the favourites to eventually change it. So, man still letting the player go, I don't think it's, it's, it spells doom on any club willing to buy the player. I think it's just good due to the options they have mm. and the quality that exists in the team right now. So, letting a player like uh, Sterling go, it's, uh, they have, we also saw uh, not too long ago, man still let uh, Leroy Sané go. Yeah. And at that point in time, Sané was one of the best wingers, best young wingers in Europe. I think his career has gone a bit sideways since he went to Bayern. But at Man City, he was on the up. And he, he left, and uh, since he left, Man City has have even gone higher. They replaced him with, uh, they put Foden there sometimes, they bring Bernardo there sometimes. They have a way of playing that even when these big names go, they are still, they are still tip top, they are still winning things. So, I don't think it's an indictment on Sterling as a person or on his qualities as a player. Yeah. I just think, uh, and you have to, have to bear in mind that Man City, they make a lot of signings. You have to balance it out some way, somehow. Yeah. You can't make all these signings without letting something go. Player go, player come. That's what happens all the time. So, Sterling going is not necessarily a bad thing for, uh, for Chelsea or for Sterling himself. Yeah. I just think that's, that's the way yeah. it goes right now. All right. Great submission there. And we'll take a quick break. Uh, this is Scorecard on City TV. And there's more. We have some more transfer news. And then we'll talk about tennis. Novak Djokovic's um, record 21st Grand Slam title. It was earlier today a fantastic victory against Nick Kyrgios. So we'll have all that just after this break. Welcome back. This is Scorecard on City TV. My name is Daniel Kranting. I'm doing this with Sydney Antonio and Emmanuel Nubo. You can also join the conversation on the WhatsApp line, plus 233-585-5832, or hashtag Scorecard on Twitter. And I'll do all to read all the messages just gone by. We've been talking about the women's AFCON and some transfer news. Um, Imano, let's uh, go back to the Chelsea matter. Um, Nathan Ake, defender. Chelsea clearly need a defender. They've lost Christensen. They've lost Rudiger. They've lost quite a number of um, personnel in that department. And they need some reinforcement. But the question is, is Nathan Ake the guy? Well, uh, it looks like they are limited for options. Because if with, with the kind of football they are playing, I'm, I'm actually surprised that there aren't a lot of rumours surrounding Chelsea buying centre-backs and there are more rumours surrounding them buying forwards and yeah. wingers. Because you, you've lost Rudiger, who was a very, very important player for them. As to how they allowed him to go, I do not know. 
And then you've also lost Christensen. In as much as he didn't play much, you had that. And it looks like they've settled for Nitanaki. Well, so on one side... Settling. Yeah, it looks like they're settling. But on one side, he's, he's, he was from the academy. Mm -hmm. He went to Bournemouth, performed well, went to Manchester City, made a name for himself. He's an integral part of the that team too. So you, you'd, want to, you'd want to bring in someone who's familiar with the league and has the quality. I think as Manchester City, in the few games which he played, he showed the quality that he has. In as much as he's not as tall as most defenders, technically he's quite good with his feet. And I think for the system with Tukel plays, with, with the three-back, he fits right into it. He can play as a left-sided centre-back, and that makes it easy. Also, he has good distribution, and um, some, um, which uh, Rudiger gave them when he was there. He could hit some long balls. He could drive the ball forward. He's a good ball carrier. I think in certain instances, he has played as a um, defensive midfielder. So he, he has a variety of quality and positions he can play, which adds quality to the team. But on the other side, even <clears throat> comparing to how Manchester City are willing to sell some of their players to their quote-unquote rivals, it shows you the gap and, and, and how far Chelsea are falling be, below. Because if you look at where Chelsea were coming from, you are European champions. Yeah. The next season, we're expecting you to challenge for the league at least. And they couldn't do that. It just shows you that Manchester City are, they are on cloud nine. They are actually afraid of nobody. They can let quality go and then it doesn't bother them. But for Chelsea, it will be a good addition to their team. It, it's, it's still not so clear to see how the complete structure of the team to, would be like because mm. it looks like some players are, as like there are rumours that he will also be out so you, they, they, they need more replacements in the defensive third yeah. Netanyahu doesn't solve that alone I, I mean we saw Chaloba too he, he, he's still young he's still developing he's still error prone but I think on, on a whole he adds a lot of quality to that team which they didn't previously have mm -hmm. he barely gets injured too so that's something you can rely on and then he has the quality, he can, he can drive the ball forward, he can hit the diagonals. And naturally, because he's a left to third player, he just slots right into the left centre-back position. So I think for Chelsea, it's a good buy. For Manchester City, it's not much of a loss. They are, they are worlds apart when it comes to um, um, positions between them and Chelsea. I, I like that <laughs> perspective, but let's, let's, let's go deeper into Chelsea's defensive problems. Okay? For a team that plays a three-back system, um, right now, let's, let's say Ake hasn't signed yet, so we can't add mm -hmm. him to the team. So they have um, Chaloba, they have um, Thiago, Silva. Thiago Silva, and then who? Nobody else. Nobody else. So how many defenders do Chelsea need to sign? They need to Let, sign let's up. say they get <coughs> Aki. Who again? Because you know the league has told his agent to stop picking Chelsea's call. <laughs> He's only interested in going to buy in Munich, so that is done. He's not coming to Chelsea. When you look on the market, who is available? Who can Chelsea actually go for and, and, and for, them, the, for the person to slot into their system and improve the quality because he spoke about Rudiger as a stance for me top three defenders best defend center backs in the world as a stance based on last season's performances he's that good and if you lose somebody like him like him you need equal level of quality or something very close to his quality well for me <clears throat> for me personally I think they should they should look at someone like Skriniar of Inter Milan he's quite a good defender he already plays in the three back system mm -hmm. he he can drive forward he can bring some he, he can add something to the attack He's good aerially also, and he has a presence. He's good when it comes to tackling. I'm surprised they are not looking at PSG. Like yeah. You understand? Skriniar is a very, very good player. And it looks like right now, what the, the fear is that Chelsea are in a position where everybody knows they are desperate for defenders. There mm -hmm. were rumors of Pundi. We don't know how far that's going to be like. And it looks like they will need to break the bank to sign two top centre-backs if they really want to. Um, sh uh, if they really want to be competitive mm -hmm. in any sense because you, ca you can't rely on Chaloba neither can you rely on Thiago Silva he's 37-38 now he can't play every game mm -hmm. so th they will need to break the bank I think some of the money they are trying to throw at Rafinha and those things they should actually stop throw, yeah, they should actually <laughs> throw it, it at the centre back because you can't rely on Malansa we saw him we saw his performance <laughs> <laughs> we saw his performances this season <laughs> I mean, the best. <laughs> Chelsea fans were, were more angry when they see him in the lineup alone. Mm. So they, they really, I, I, I think Kunde, Skriniar are players which they should actually be targeting and trying to break the bank to get. That would actually bring some solidity to their defense. Yeah. And they, they also need to find, try start to find a replacement for Thiago Silva. He's not going to play forever. He's what, 38 now? 38, yeah. 30. He's not an iron man too. So <laughs> He's not. <laughs> definitely they, not. They, they, let's let's they, go to another team that is struggling to... Um, get deals over the line. After how many weeks of the transfer window, they signed only one player. But everybody knows they are so supposed to sign the most players and the most players with quality. They've chased 
the young for how long? They still not signed the young. Um, but the latest transfer rumor is that they are interested. That is Manchester United. They are interested in um, Leandro Paredes. He's a defensive midfielder who plays for PSG. He's valued at 30 million euros. Um, Sydney, I'm very glad you are in a Manchester United shirt. First of all, we all know United needs a DM. Um, in all the rumors we've heard, the transfer rumors, no defensive midfielder has come up during this time. No tangible or very believable, reliable rumor has come um, linking Man United with a, de a, a defensive midfielder. The closest, I think, was uh, the Lissandro Martinez guy, who's a centre-back, but can play as a DM. So, is this good news? Daniel, it just beats my imagination. I, I, I just can't fathom how a team of the structure like Man United, you can go how many seasons without a proper DM who can play, uh, let's say, 36, 37 games guaranteed that he's going to do well. You had uh, Mourinho came inside, Mourinho brought Matic. A Matic who had regressed from his time at Chelsea, bought him for about £40 million. And true to type, he did well initially, but the guy was on his last legs. Like, mm -hmm. he was only able to offer his retirement bonus. <laughs> and he came and he did what he could do, and now he's gone fully Mourinho to, to AS Roma. Mm. And apart from him, there's nobody the team has chased for the past five seasons. Bring us a DM, you go and bring Fred. Are, are you serious at all? <laughs> are you serious at all? So it makes me question, and just this season, well, the, the scouting network has been reshuffled. The head of the global recruitment has been replaced. And you would have thought that having these high-profile figures leave the club, you would have thought that somebody with the foresight, somebody with... A, a plan and a vision would have earmarked this position as somewhere, some a position where we have to strengthen in if we want to be serious. And we have spent the better time of three months following this Dion Ghost, the guy who <laughs> doesn't even want to come to the, the team. Because with all, for all intents and purposes, the guy wants to stay in Barcelona. He yeah. has said it so many times. His heart is at Barcelona. Barcelona is the biggest club <laughs> in the world, blah, 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 blah. This team that owe you 17 million euros that they can't pay you, but you still want to stay there. Okay, then stay he there. Let's look, for, <laughs> <laughs> let's look for replacements. Let's look for other guys because I don't believe this is the only guy who can affect the team in a positive manner. And he's not even a priority position, I would say, for the, for the team right now. Firstly, the defensive, a, a solid defensive midfielder, somebody who is physical, somebody who can win the area battle, somebody who can win. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you've mentioned that. These attributes you are mentioning. Um, somebody who's physical, somebody who can win the area. Is that Leandro, Leandro Paredes? That is not Leandro Paredes as well. I feel I think Paredes will be, he's more of a deep line playmaker, more of somebody in the, I would say, uh, Jorginho mode or uh, Andrea Pello mode of old, or you can say more of a De Jong. De Jong also can, Frankie De Jong can also play that position. Although at Barcelona, I've seen him more in the box to box role, but. He's also very adept at playing that deep line play macaro as we saw at Ajax. So it seems like Ten Hag is craving a player of that, that mode. Mm -hmm. A player who can orchestrate, who can pull the strings, a godfather of sorts from the, the, the base of midfield. Yeah. So well, that, may, that, may, that may give us a glimpse or that, that can give us a glimpse into what he wants to bring to the team, how he wants the, the, the team to play. But I just hope he doesn't go on to regret this because... The English league is a very physical league. The English league is a very demanding league. You need players who can win that duels. That's the first thing you need above all else. In the midfield position, if you can't win your duels in the EPL, you are not going anywhere. You need players who can match their counterparts boot for boot. And some, some of these players, uh, if you are not even physical, you need to have that tenacity about you. Somebody like Bernardo Silva. We saw him... Uh, at the beginning of stage of his career, I was playing an attacking midfield role. When Pep Guardiola did his midfield reshuffle, Bernardo has dropped deeper and deeper and deeper. Sometimes he plays in a three midfield yeah. with Rodri and uh, De Bruyne. And you don't, you, don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't miss that tenacity. You don't miss that aggression. Yeah. Those are the kind of players we should be looking at getting for the team. If we're not going to when you say for, we, you mean Manchester United. We, exactly. You Manchester United, <laughs> friends of MU. That's the place we need. If you're not going to look for that physically imposing yeah. player, then you can look for somebody who is tenacious enough, a Kante kind of player who maybe you won't have the strength to bully off players, but who will be at your, at your heels every time, yeah. willing wants to get the ball. It seemed as if Fred was metamorphosizing to that kind of player, but he's too weak. He's too weak on the <laughs> ball. You, you push the ball small, he's bumped off. Push the ball small, he's bumped off. So I don't think that quality is not there yet. So 
it's a problem position that we have needed to strengthen in for a long time. It, it has gone this long without addressing. It's gone far too long, in my opinion. By mm. now, there's there are place on the market we could get. Look at Ibrahim Sangari. The guy has done well. He did very well at Toulouse. He got his move to PSV. He has done very well in the Eredivisie. He did well in the Europa League as well. Why aren't you looking at someone like that? Look at somebody like, in my opinion, and Idris Aganagi. Albeit he hasn't performed to his uh, higher standards mm -hmm. recently at PSG, but we saw what he could do in the Everton shirt. Yeah. We saw what he could do in the Premier League. We saw, we saw what he could do in the AFCON. He shows us that he still has something about him. He can still contribute something. Yeah. He can contribute more than the lacks of McTominay and <laughs> James Garner, who have been rumored to <laughs> join. He's, he's a far better player than this guy. So it beats my imagination why M Match United are not looking for these kind of players. And they are. See, wa wa wakasa, Wakasa, you, mm. if, you spoke. You spoke. <laughs> got, he's speaking from a place of pain. A <laughs> <laughs> place of pain. I understand your frustration, but let me read you a couple of messages that have come through. Um, I'll start with Twitter. The hashtag is scorecard. Um, this one comes from Prince Edu. He says, I love your program so much. Um, Ken D, he says, Tukal revived um, the almost dead career of Rudiger. And he says he's sure he'll do the same with Nathan Ake. More messages um, coming through. Um, this one says, and this is from Kudia Bano. He's talking about Cristiano Ronaldo. He says, Ronaldo is leaving um, because Salah is more, <laughs> any more money than him and he wants more money. Interesting message there. Um, I'll read a couple more messages on WhatsApp a bit later. But let's do some um, preseason action. Arsenal were in action. And they played their first preseason game uh, behind closed doors. I think it was against Millwall a couple of weeks ago. But this is their first official preseason game. They went um, to Germany to take on Nuremberg. And they were 2-0 down. But then Jesus came through, scored two goals. Mohamed added another. And they ended up winning by five goals to two. Yeah, so Arsenal winning by five goals to three. Very impressive victory there. Um, guys, <laughs> Gabriel Jesus. In very, it's, it's, it's very rare for you to see a Jesus and Mohammed combination. <laughs> right after Jesus got Mohammed scored. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, it's preseason. It looks all pretty. But I, look, I mean, I'm happy for Jesus. It's it's good for him to go to a team where he's appreciated, where he feels like he's the top man. Mm. And I keep hinting at the World Cup because no nobody wants to go to the World Cup not in form, and everybody yeah. wants to make the team. So if you're in a team where you are not playing, it's not the best. And then I, I think. It looks pretty now, but I mean, we know uh, uh, what's his um, Mikel Arteta. We don't know. We we all. <laughs> <laughs> we, I mean, preseason it looks good. We all don't know what or how it's going to look when the competition really starts, and then you start putting him against tougher oppositions. Will he crumble? Will he will he be able to show that? Okay, I've been to I've been in this I've been in this job for four years, yeah. and now. I've, I've gathered enough experience to be able to take Arsenal to the next level. Manu, quick, quickly before we move to the next game, the Crystal Palace game. Um, we talk, I know it's just the first game of preseason, but we talk about the deployment. Um, when Gabriel Jesus was signed, people were talking about Eddie Nketiah may not have the opportunity to be Arsenal's leading striker. But we saw in this game, both of them played together, and we saw some very good interplay. So it, it looks like, is it, is it safe to say that Arteta has a plan in that regard, playing the two of them together? Well, I, I think it's something that can be, that can work for them. Jesus already, with the experience he has at Manchester City, he's played in various attacking positions. Mm -hmm. He's come off the wing, played as a central figure, played on the left-hand side. So then it gives you that dexterity. So you, it's, it, it gives you more options in attack. You can either play him as a one or you can play him with another striker. Yeah. Let's not forget, Pepe is still in their ranks. Mm. Should he come good, he could. He could add to the mix. So we've been waiting for him to come. I, I mean, <laughs> for how many years? I mean, for for every coach, it's good to have options. It's yeah. good to have players who can do multiple things and play multiple positions. Mm. In that way, also, it, it it helps you to freshen up what you, the tactics, and then it doesn't make you one-dimensional, and then you are just predictable. So I think it's good for them. Let's let's hope that he actually says he wants to play for Ghana. He gets more playing time, and then it benefits Arsenal and Ghana in, in the same in the same. Eddie, way. we need you. Come. <laughs> We are recruiting players. This is your time. Come. Um, before we go off for a break, let me just show you Crystal Palace. They beat Millwall by five goals to four. Jordan Ayew. Ghana's Jordan Ayew was on target in that game. So Jordan Ayew on target. Crystal Palace winning by five goals to four. Um, that was played outside Sellers Park. Look at the quality of the pitch. A pitch outside their stadium. <laughs> this life. <laughs> hey! That's the pitch outside the stadium. We have a long way to go. <laughs> very, very, very long. It's serious. That's what the under 18s and under 20s want to go. Remember, yeah, they say that there's no enough uh, 
water to water, water to the water pitches. Water the pitch. Imagine. Jesus Christ. A, na a national stadium. I mean, Imagine. You, you look at the, the virtue of the pitch. It even adds to the quality of the yeah. football that has been played there. It's so important. So, I mean, so important. We take a lot of things for granted in this side of the world. In fact, this country, let me talk for myself. This country, we take a lot of things for granted. If you are watching, that's the pitch outside Sellers Park. Outside Sellers Park. That's what they are under 21s, under 18s. So when you go to under 17 World Cup and they are shipping you, it's because they, look at this, look at the quality of pitch. <laughs> look at the quality of pitch. So they come back and let me go for a break. <laughs> I'm tired. See, <laughs> we'll go for a quick break. When we come back, uh, we'll zone in on some tennis. Uh, the Wimbledon uh, men's and women's final was, um, it was held over the weekend. Um, there was a winner in the women's um, draw. Um, Ra What's her name for? It's very difficult. R Y D A K I N A. Rabakina. That's her name. Elena Rabakina, Russian born Kazakhstani. She um, became the first Kazakhstani woman to win uh, the Wimbledon and then Novak Djokovic, of course. We'll give you those highlights after this break. Welcome back. This is Scorecard on City TV. My name is Daniel Kranting. We're in the home stretch of the program. Um, let's do some tennis now. Um, on Saturday, that was yesterday, the women's final for Wimbledon um, took place. It was Elena Rebakina. She's of uh, Kazakhstan. She was taken on Tunisia's own Jaber. Both women were aiming to make history. Um, Rebakina won that. She became the first Kazakhstani woman to win a Grand Slam title. So Elena Rebakina becoming the first Kazakhstani woman to win a Grand Slam title. But somebody who's done it over and over and over and over and over again, Novak Djokovic. Today he made it 21 Grand Slam titles. After the first, uh, first set, some people were happy. But Djokovic was like, goodness me, I've done it over and over and over again. And people are still rejoicing when I'm down. He came back from a set down to beat uh, Nick Kyrgios by in four sets. Comfortable victory in the end for the Serbian beast, the champion Novak Djokovic. 21 Grand Slam titles for Novak Djokovic, one more than Roger Federer. So now Federer is left behind. Um, Nadal has 22, Djokovic has 21, Federer, he got to 21st, I think, and he's still on 20. Interesting stuff there. But guys, um, Djokovic has done it 21. Yeah. Um, pretty, kind of difficult if you look at what he went through from the quarterfinals to the semifinals to the finals. Um, he had to fight, but he eventually got it. I mean, it, it just shows the quality he has. Maybe a bit of rust in there, but he, he, has, he has clearly showed that mm. he's top. And when it comes to grass, there's, there's no competing with him. I mean, in comparison with the women, as the the women, the old guard have been washed out, and then yeah. the, there's new blood. But with the men, the old guard are still there. And I mean, I, I, I it's it's rather unfortunate. We would have wanted to see a Djokovic Nadal final to to see how it goes then. But I mean, this final was quite entertaining too. I think yeah. it lasted three hours plus. Yeah. But then Djokovic, has, he he showed his experience and he showed why he's one of the best tennis players ever. Guys, you know the interesting thing about the women's final, what I enjoyed most? Now, you know the Russians and the Belarusians were banned from this competition. Now, Elena Rybakina, she was Russian until 2018. She was born in Moscow. She still lives in Moscow. She just changed her nationality to Kazakhstan back in 2018, and then she won. You see how life is? <laughs> <laughs> it's, so, it's so interesting. Like, life works in very funny ways. Very, very, very funny. funny but going back to uh, the, the men's final, mm. Brilliant game, brilliant, brilliant to watch. I was, I was rooting. All that men are I was rooting for Djokovic. You always hear, oh, really? yes, we always, hear, <laughs> we always hear. I don't buy it. Oh, God, I was rooting for Djokovic because we always hear the the power of the underdog story. But for me, the the story of the favorites is more appealing to me. When you have the whole world expecting you to do something and you go ahead and do it, it it, it takes a certain strength of will, a certain strength of character to be able to do that. Djokovic showed us once again. Why he's the best and why he might retire as the player with the most titles with in both the men's and the women's game. Fantastic game there. And also nice to see the, the budding bromance between uh, Kyrgios and Djokovic. They used to be at loggerheads in the past. But since Djokov uh, since Kyrgios uh, was in Djokovic's corner for the Australian Open, yeah. Bohaha, they have now developed this bromance and long may it continue. Long may it continue. He says uh, Djokovic may retire as the greatest of all time. That's another fan saying it. The truth is one. The truth is one. But that's it for Scorecard here on City TV. My name is Daniel Franklin. I did this with uh, Sydney Antonio and Emmanuel Lugura. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your messages. Until next week, take care and bye-bye.